Do you want to play as the point break of the Avengers? Well, that's what we're going to do, because this is D&D Builds where we have an outlet to make all sorts of ridiculous Dungeons and Dragons characters and stop driving the people in our lives insane with them. This time, we're going to be building the God of Thunder, Thor. Whether you just want to hammer the crap out of your enemies with Mjolnir, you want to go for the head with Stormbreaker, or if you just want to use your godly powers to rain down thunder and lightning, we'll cover all of it. But first things first, we gotta pick a race. In the comics, Thor has been everything from a celestial godly man to channeling his power into a normal human, being a man, woman, or even in the comics at one point, a goat. But in the end, the one thing that stays true is that godly power. And since you are channeling the powers of a celestial god, there's an easy choice for a race. We're gonna go Asimar. Asimars are essentially angels in D&D, but it's really just that they harness the power of celestials. And I can't think of a better correlation to an Asgardian than an Asimar. Asimar gives us bonuses to charisma, and you get to choose a sub-race. We're going to grab the Protector Asimar sub-race, because you are the Protector of Midgar. Grabbing the Protector Asimar background also gives us a boost to wisdom. And when you activate your Radiant Soul or your inner godly power, this causes your eyes to glimmer with radiant energy, allowing you to transform into a much more godly form for one minute. Additionally, you get Celestial Resilience, which grants you resistance to necrotic and radiant damage, Light Bearer, giving you the Light Cantrip, Dark Vision, and Healing Hands, giving you the ability to heal somebody once per long rest for an amount of hit points equal to your level. And finally, you get two languages which are common and celestial. As we go ahead and start leveling up Thor, we're going to try and do it in order of the movies, really focusing on his abilities as he grows as a character. Going from Thor to Thor the Dark World, all the way through Thor Ragnarok and the Avengers movies. And as you're a god of Asgard, you are the child of Odin, the Allfather. Odin is the king of Asgard, making you nobility. So that makes choosing a background pretty easy. We're gonna go with Noble. This gives you proficiencies in history and persuasion, one type of gaming set, and one language of your choice. And since early on in the movies you deal with the giants a bit, let's just grab the language giant. You also get features like Position of privilege. There's no way you can be born as nobility of Asgard without having a bit of privilege to go along with it. And with the race and background chosen, let's jump into some stats. Thor does like to think of himself as the strongest Avenger, even if he might not be correct. So we're going to put 15 points into strength, maxing it out. We don't have a ton of points to spare, so we're going to just keep dexterity at a baseline of 10, because even though he is smaller and can move around somewhat quickly, he does have a bit of a bulky frame, and he's not known for pure nimbleness, so I think this is fine. Constitution, we're going to set at 14, because we want him to be able to take a couple hits. Intelligence, we're going to dump to 8. As far as the Avengers go, he is definitely not top of his class. And while some might argue that Thor isn't very wise, he actually does have a very good understanding of how the universe works, especially between Midgar and Asgard and all of the other celestial bodies going on. And because of this understanding, we're going to boost Wisdom to 13 and then get another plus one from our Protector Asimar race. Then finally Charisma, people do seem to love Thor and he is quite charming, at least until he gets very depressed. But at least most of the time, he is very lovable. So we're going to put 12 into Charisma and then get another plus 2 from our Asimar race. When choosing the starting class, I was super tempted to grab some Paladin to start. Because when I think of somebody that rains down with a big hammer, I can't help but think of a Paladin. But the thing is, I'm trying to be very accurate. Even though Paladins can smite with divine power, that smite is usually some sort of radiant damage. And Thor very specifically uses thunder or lightning damage. And granted, we can grab some smite spells like thunderous smite, and we could apply that, but I think there's a better way to go about this. We're going to try and go in order of the movies, and in the first movie, he doesn't really use much of his godly power. He just uses his overall strength and battle ability. So with that in mind, instead of going with a paladin, we're going to start with a fighter. At first level of fighter, you get proficiency in all armor, all shields, all simple weapons, all martial weapons, and you get saving throws in 
strength, and constitution. Finally, you get to choose two skills, and the first one's easy, we're just gonna grab athletics, but the second one's a little more difficult to choose. You have a handful of choices being a fighter, and I don't wanna go with insight because you're constantly being tricked by Loki, and you should have better insight to be able to see through that. You're usually more charming than intimidating, and acrobatics just isn't really your thing as much as it is Black Widow's. We never see him dealing too much with animal handling, and we already have history. So it's really just between perception and survival. So with that in mind, we're just gonna grab perception. It's one of the most useful things in D&D. You get to start off with some chainmail, which seems pretty accurate considering the armor that Thor wears, at least to start, because I'm sure that middle part with all those random chunks of metal would be much more heavy armor-esque. So we'll just know that we get to upgrade to that later. You also get a martial weapon to start, so we're just gonna grab a warhammer. Granted, this isn't Mjolnir because that would be a legendary weapon and we're not going quite there yet. And then for the additional martial weapon we get to grab, I would grab a great axe just for having Stormbreaker later. But again, that would be another legendary or artifact level weapon and there's no way you're gonna get that at level one. You also get a few other pieces of equipment, but most of them don't really apply that much. Then you get to choose a fighting style. And while he does throw his weapons a lot, we can't grab thrown weapon fighting because that would require the weapon to actually have the thrown property right off the bat. And Warhammers don't really have that. You can throw them, but they do minimal damage and they're not very accurate. So instead, just to make sure Thor can take a few more hits, we're gonna grab defense. This increases your armor class by one. I was tempted to also grab unarmed fighting because we do see him do some punching here and there, but usually he relies on whatever weapon he has handy. At first level of fighter, you also get second wind. This just allows you to regain some hit points as a bonus action. Kind of like you're just channeling some of your godly power to help restore you a little bit. At second level, you get action surge, which is definitely useful to have as a fighter. Then at third level, you get to choose a fighter subclass. I was really tempted to try and grab Rune Knight because Mjolnir and his weapons tend to have some really cool looking runes on it, but that really leans towards giants. And most of the time, Asgardians are kind of at war with the giants, so it didn't really feel right. The other good option would be Eldritch Knight, but they really focus on using their intelligence for spellcasting, so that didn't feel right either. Another good choice would be Battlemaster, but early on, Thor doesn't really focus on battle strategies or techniques. He just kind of brutes his way through and just relies on his overall ability. So instead, I'm gonna go with Champion as he is a champion of Asgard. Champion is one of the most simple subclasses for fighter to choose, but it is pretty useful. It gives you improved critical right off the bat, allowing you to score a critical hit on a 19 or a 20. Then at fourth level, we're gonna grab an ability score improvement, and obviously we're gonna go with strength because like we said, you think you're one of the strongest Avengers even if somebody's always got you beat. Then at fifth level, you get the all important extra attack. If you use this along with your action surge, you can attack up to four times in a round. Then at sixth level, you get another ability score improvement right away because fighters are awesome when it comes to ability score improvements. So we're gonna boost our strength again bringing it up to 19. And then for level seven of the overall build, we're actually gonna do a multi-class. And this is right around the time that the Avengers movie comes out. While I was super tempted to grab something like a Storm Herald Barbarian, their actual abilities, even though they can lean towards some thunder or lightning damage, don't really work as well as I would like, at least when you're focusing on the lightning side. So instead, we're gonna play up the fact that everybody's really focusing on the whole idea of Thor being essentially a god. And the best class to go with when it comes to focusing on godly powers is Cleric. So at seventh level of this build overall, we're gonna grab our first level of Cleric. At first level of Cleric, you get some spell casting and you get to choose a divine domain or a subclass right away. And this is gonna be the easiest choice because there's a Tempest Cleric, which focuses totally on thunder and lightning. Choosing this subclass gives you some additional spells to choose from, but we're gonna save all those spells until the end. But additionally at this level, you get Wrath of the Storm. This ability allows you to rebuke an attacker that hits you, forcing them to make a dexterity saving throw against your wisdom DC. That creature will take 2d8 lightning or thunder damage, your choice, or half as much on a successful save, allowing us to finally start bringing in that whole god of thunder thing. And I should note that Thor is the god of thunder and 
D&D references thunder as more of sound damage, but in the Marvel Universe, when they refer to thunder, they're also referring to lightning, so it kind of goes hand in hand. Just wanted to call that out. Then at second level of cleric, you get channel divinity. Normal clerics really use this to affect the undead in some ways, but a tempest cleric can use their channel divinity for destructive wrath, allowing you the ability to deal max damage anytime you deal lightning or thunder damage as long as you spend that use of the channel divinity. But use it wisely, because at this level, you only get one channel divinity. At third level of cleric, you get the opportunity to use some higher powered spells. And then at fourth level, you get an ability score improvement. And at this point, you might be screaming about that 19 in strength that I haven't quite rounded out yet, but don't worry. I'm saving that for later. So this time I'm going to focus more on being able to take a few more hits and we're gonna boost up our constitution. Then at fifth level of cleric, you get the ability to destroy undead with your channel divinity, but that doesn't really play in too much to this build. It's just worth noting. And you also get some more powerful spells. Then at sixth level, you get one more use of your channel divinity. And also at this level, your subclass grants you thunderous strike, just allowing you to push somebody 10 feet away if you're dealing lightning or thunder damage to them. At 7th level you get some stronger spells and then at 8th level you get one more ability score improvement so we're gonna boost up our constitution again bringing up to 18 and you can destroy stronger undead but again that doesn't really matter too much for this build and you get one more feature from your divine domain being a tempest cleric. And we're finally going to be factoring in some thunder and lightning damage to your normal strikes because at this level you get divine strike giving you the ability to infuse your weapon strikes with divine energy so once per turn when you hit somebody with a melee attack you can deal an additional 1d8 thunder damage to the target. Now I think that really brings us through the Avengers and probably through Thor the Dark World. And now we're gonna make our way to Thor Ragnarok. And I have to mention something about Thor Ragnarok because it's been driving me nuts to not talk about this. But it will include some spoilers, so if you have not seen Thor Ragnarok, even though it's been out for years now, there's a time code listed down below, you can skip to it, and that's where we'll get right back to the build. But for those that I just cannot help but talk about this with, there's something absolutely awesome in Thor Ragnarok that is just nobody seems to talk about enough and that's the immigrant song from led zeppelin this song is so impactful to the movie that they actually used it twice once at the beginning and once at the climax of the movie and i feel like not enough people are putting enough thought into this except for maybe taika waititi who is the director of the film and obviously he's probably the one who thought of this in the first place but the immigrant song relates so much to everything going on in the story of this movie that it essentially tells you what's going to happen from the very first time you hear it so the few key things about this song is that one it's an awesome freaking song from led zeppelin there's no reason not to use it twice two it's literally referencing the hammer of the gods specifically talking about Thor. Three, it references coming from the land of the ice and snow, which could be a reference to where Odin shipped off to, or it could be a reference to Loki and how he came from the land of the ice giants. Four, it talks about Valhalla I am coming, which is either a reference to the Valkyries and all of their dealing with Valhalla, or it could be about Odin and his journey to Valhalla. Next, it talks about being in the fields of green where Odin actually wound up and how it can whisper tales of gore. And this is all about the point in the movie where the actual tales of their battles are becoming present and it's starting to rip away the facade that's there, revealing the overall brutal battles that were dealt with when Odin was fighting alongside Hela. And how after they became overlords, which is referenced again in the song, they calmed the tides of war, as in the time for Hela has passed. Then finally, the name of the song and the references to taking a boat to new shores and escaping these atrocities, it's about the end of the movie all of the people of asgard become immigrants fleeing asgard and making a new home i mean the use of this song was fucking genius sorry i know i got super hyped up about that but i just felt like 
I needed to let that out. Now we can get back to the build and in Thor Ragnarok, Thor really finds his inner strength and allows him to channel that god of thunder and lightning directly from himself, not focusing on any particular weapons. And there's a very specific type of magic caster in D&D that is all about channeling magic from your inner power. Wizards use their knowledge of books, clerics use their connection to the divine, druids use their connection to nature, but sorcerers use their inner power, and that's what we're going with. So at this level, we're getting another multi-class going over to Sorcerer. At first level of Sorcerer, you get some spell casting, which again, we're going to focus on towards the end of this video. And you also get to choose a Sorcerer subclass or Sorceress origin. And of course, we're going to choose Storm Sorcery. This subclass focuses entirely on magic revolving around storms. As soon as you choose this subclass, you get Wind Speaker, allowing you to speak, read, and write Primordial, allowing you to speak with people whose dialects include Aquan, Orin, Ignan, or Terran. Terrans tend to be more earth elemental type creatures, and this is the exact reason you can communicate with Groot. Also, when you choose the subclass, you can use your bonus action to allow whirling gusts of elemental air to briefly surround you, allowing you to fly up to 10 feet. And I should note that even though we can kind of see Thor flying in the Marvel movies, he's not actually flying. According to Stan Lee and Marvel Comics and everybody else, he's not using the power of flight. He's actually kind of using the momentum of his incredibly magical weapons to allow him to soar through the air, and then he just kind of redirects that energy as he soars through. He personally doesn't have the ability to fly. So this is going to be a bit more of jumping pretty intensely, without having to worry about fall damage at least. Then at second level of Sorcerer, you get Font of Magic, which just allows you to have sorcery points, which you can use for meta magic later, allowing you to alter your spells here and there. Or you can trade off sorcery points for spell slots, allowing you to cast a few more spells here and there. At third level of this class, you get some spells you can cast at a higher level, at least on the sorcerer side, and you get meta magic. We'll cover our meta magic along with the spells at the end of this video. At fourth level, you get an ability score improvement. And this is the last ability score improvement we're going to be able to get in this build, so it's pretty crucial. At this point in the game, you should probably have a good idea of what your end weapon will be, whether it's Mjolnir or Stormbreaker. So with that in mind, we're going to choose our feet based off of which weapon you have. In Tasha's Cauldron of Everything, they included two feats that focus very specifically on the type of weapon you're using. So if you're using Mjolnir, we're going to grab Crusher. This will allow you to increase your strength by one, finally allowing you to max it out, and it focuses purely on bludgeoning damage. When you hit a creature with an attack that deals bludgeoning damage, you can move them up to five feet at the same time because you hit them so hard with brute strength. Additionally, when you score a critical hit, which can happen a bit more often since you have the champion subclass and fighter, dealing that critical hit with bludgeoning damage kind of concusses your enemy, really just throwing them off guard, making that so all attack rolls against that creature are made with advantage until the start of your next turn. So if it happens on the last attack of your turn, it's not quite as helpful, but it still helps the rest of your team. Meanwhile, if you're working with Stormbreaker, which is just a giant axe, you can take the feat Slasher. This also increases your strength by one, making it so you can max it out. And once per turn, when you hit a creature with an attack that deals slashing damage, which is what you get with an axe, you can reduce the speed of the target by 10 until your next turn. And finally, if you score a critical hit that deals slashing damage, you grieve wound it, making it so that target has disadvantage on all of its attack rolls. But frankly, if you're hitting with Stormbreaker, you should probably try and go for the head anyways. Then at 5th level of Sorcerer, you get some higher level spell slots. At 6th level, which is the last level of this build overall, you get two features from your Storm Sorcerer subclass. You get Storm Guide, which kind of allows you to control the weather a little bit, which I guess is accurate, but it's not overly impressive. Then you also get Heart of the Storm. This feature makes it so whenever you start casting a spell of first level or higher that deals lightning or thunder damage, stormy magic erupts from you. This eruption causes creature of your choice that you can see within 10 feet of you to take lightning or thunder damage. Granted, at this level it's not a ton of damage because it's only equal to half of your sorcerer level, but it's still something and it just 
kind of lets lightning just shoot out of you as you're casting spells. And just to hammer on the specifics, it does say when you start casting a spell, not when you finish casting the spell. So if somebody were to try and come in and cast counter spell or something, this would still activate. But with all of this talk about spells, it's probably time we jump into the spell casting. We're not going to go through every single spell that you're going to get between your cleric and your sorcerer class, but we're at least going to cover the things that are important to this build. And we're going to start with the cantrips. As far as the cleric cantrips, there's not really a whole lot that applies. I would grab thaumaturgy to let your voice boom out a little more intensely, and then probably Word of Radiance. This just allows for radiant energy to blast out from inside of you. Granted, it's specifically radiant energy, and we did make this whole thing about dealing radiant versus lightning or thunder, but it's one of the only useful ways to reenact anything from the cleric cantrips, so we might as well grab it. Meanwhile, with the sorcerer cantrips, we get a few more choices. We're obviously gonna grab Booming Blade because there's no way we wouldn't have get this as it deals thunder damage as you smash down with either Mjolnir or Stormbreaker. And mixing this cantrip along with your Divine Strike ability really boosts up your thunder damage that you can deal on a regular basis. We'll grab Shock and Grasp just because if you grab somebody you have the ability to shock them I guess. And then you also want to definitely grab Thunderclap. This allows you to let out a burst of thunderous sound that can be heard up to 100 feet away, dealing 4d6 thunder damage to those within 5 feet of you. Just kind of like smashing Mjolnir into the ground and letting out a large boom, or maybe into Cap Shield. Then if you just want to grab Lightning Lure just for an additional lightning cantrip, might as well grab it. There's not really a whole lot of stuff where he uses lightning to pull somebody in, but it's a lightning cantrip, so... Let's just grab it. As far as actual spells, not cantrips, on the cleric side, we're definitely going to grab Thunder Wave right off the bat. It's one of the few thunder or lightning related spells you can get as a cleric, and not only that, but you have to be a Tempest cleric just to get access to it, which is really just kind of a slightly more powerful thunderclap. At third level of cleric, you get Shatter, which is the only other thunder related spell because it deals thunder damage. And then at fifth level of cleric, we get one of the things that we see most from from Thor, at least most notably because it is one of the more visually striking elements, and that's Call Lightning. Raining down lightning is kind of one of the biggest things Thor is known for, and it's a super powerful spell. I was tempted to try and find a way just to grab this spell in general, but usually it's just for druids. Thankfully, you get it from being a Tempest Cleric. Then the only other spells I would kind of consider that would relate to Thor are Divination, for when you go into that pool and kind of get visions of the future or what's really going on. Death Ward, to help stop you from dying because you're kind of a god or immortal or whatever the hell you may be. And then Banishment because you utilize the ability to banish people to other parts of the universe a few times throughout the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Granted, half the time it's bringing Loki back to Asgard, but it's still kind of relevant, so might as well grab it. When it comes to sorcery spells, I would grab Shield because there's all those times when you tend to either use Stormbreaker to just block a blast on your way down, or you spin around Mjolnir to shield yourself, so I think that's pretty fitting. A spell we can't avoid grabbing is Thunderstep because it just kind of lets you teleport to an unoccupied space with a loud boom, dealing some thunder damage along the way. But the most important spell we really want to grab from being a sorcerer is Lightning Bolt. It's one of the most notable spells in D&D and it lets out a huge line of lightning. And this seems pretty damn accurate to what we see in the movies. But since this does let out a huge line and your overall charisma isn't quite as high as if you went pure spellcaster, the saving throw isn't gonna be quite as high. So with metamagic, I would go ahead and grab Heightened Spell. This forces one target of your spell to roll at disadvantage, which is going to be pretty useful. The other big one I would grab is probably Quicken Spell. This will allow you to cast a spell that usually takes an action as a bonus action, which will give you additional opportunities to really focus on the melee combat. You can cast a spell as your bonus action and then follow it up with plenty of hits. Or you can simply use it to cast Booming Blade, really let down one heavy duty smash and follow up with two additional attacks as your normal action. The the only alterations I would make if I changed anything about this build is if I did go Paladin, it would give me the opportunity to have grabbed Elemental Weapon, which would have been very useful because
because you could constantly deal magic damage. And if I had done that, I would have gone Paladin 12, Cleric 8, still grabbing the Tempest Cleric, and I would have just really focused on Thunderous Smite over and over again. But that would have not given us any way to get Lightning Bolt, and we cannot lose out on Lightning Bolt. It's too good of a spell as far as lightning damage goes. And the only other thing I wish we could grab as far as spells is something like Investiture into Lightning. You can get Investiture into Flame, or Investiture into Wind, or most of the other elements, but Investiture into Lightning isn't a thing. So if you have a super nice DM that lets you alter a spell a little bit just for flavor, see if they'll let you change Investiture of Flame into Investiture of Lightning, and just change all of the fire damage dealt by the spell into lightning damage instead. But that's only if you have somebody that's being super nice and considerate of your overall build. Lastly, we gotta talk about Mjolnir and Stormbreaker. Mjolnir doesn't have a direct correlation in D&D, but there's something that's pretty close, and it's a legendary weapon called Whelm. It pops up in the White Plume Mountain Adventure, but it does require attunement by a dwarf. So that would be the only real alteration you would need to make, but it does have the ability Throne Weapon, giving you the ability to throw it 60 feet, and it will return to your hand, just like Mjolnir does, and you have the ability to use an action to strike the ground with Whelm and send out a shock wave from the point of impact, which stuns every creature within 60 feet. The only other weird thing about this weapon is that it's actually a sentient weapon because there's a soul living inside of it, so it's going to constantly try and talk to you in Dwarvish. But this particular weapon does really hate giants, and that seems pretty fitting for the overall war between the Asgardians and the Frost Giants. Meanwhile, Stormbreaker is a little harder to find a direct correlation with. If anybody in the comments happens to know what that might be, especially if there's something already existing in 5th edition, please let me know in the comments down below. I was really hunting for it for a while and I could not find anything, especially if it only needs some small modifications. But speaking of the comments, if you have anything that you would like built, anything that you would do differently, or if you just want to shout out and say, hey, you're an idiot, totally fine. Let me know in the comments down below. And if you really want to help this channel a ton, you could be like these awesome people. They're my patrons, they help contribute to this channel, and they actually voted on which build to do next, which of course led to a three-way tie. So then I turned to all of you on YouTube. I put out another poll listing the same options and you all voted. So thank you so much for helping to decide that this was the next build to come. Granted, it only squeaked out by about 3%, so I think it's pretty obvious what's coming next. But still, thanks to my patrons so much, they are so freaking awesome. And if you want to help contribute to my Patreon, the link is in the description down below. But if you just don't want to miss out on any future polls, postings, videos, any of that stuff, don't forget to subscribe because you've made it all the way to the end here and hopefully that means you enjoyed this content a little bit. And if you made it all the way to the end here, let me know by hitting the like button. It lets me know you got all the way here and it helps the channel. And I'll be hoping you roll at least three nat 20s on your next D&D session, especially if you're going to go as the god of thunder and lightning, Thor. Even if you might have a smart ass bard or artificer in the party calling you point break repeatedly.